Welcome to the launch of the final report of the Commission for Smart Government, Strategic, Capable, Innovative, Accountable, Four Steps to Smarter Government. This event is being held uh, in Whitehall. There are a few people present here, uh, compliant with the COVID rules. Uh, everybody else is joining us online. I apologize for the delay in the start, uh, but welcome. It's going to be an interactive event. We're looking forward to people being able to talk to the Commission, uh, both those of you who are present here in uh, this room and those of you who are joining on, online. I thought what I would um, do first of all is just talk a little bit about why we set up the Commission uh, and the background. Uh, and then I'm going to hand over to Sophie Miramadi, who's our project director, to talk a little bit about some of the proposals that we've made, focusing particularly on the areas of capability and innovation. And I'm then going to invite Michael Gove, the Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster, who has very kindly agreed to be present here at the launch of these proposals to respond. We're very grateful to Michael uh, for joining us and, and delighted. Uh, that he uh, is able to take part in this event as well. This all started back in 2014 when a few of us got together uh, to form Govern Up. I'd been interested in the reform of the machinery of government uh, before that time, uh, having set up the reform think tank. I vividly remember working with one of the world's great reformers, Ruth Richardson from New Zealand, on a report that we did called Spending Without Reform. And I was struck by how little interest there was in many of the things we were saying. Why? Because we were talking about the machinery of government. We weren't talking so much about policy and we weren't talking about politics. And it's those latter two things that excite interest in the political world and of course in the media world, the machinery is of less interest. After all, if you go and buy a car, you want to know that the car is beautiful, that it goes. Few of us are expert on the internal mechanics, but you soon become interested in the mechanics, if not as an expert, then as the consumer, if the car stops working, or if the car is working imperfectly, suddenly, it becomes really important to us all that the mechanics of the car do work, that it functions properly. What I think we've seen over the course of the last few years is a growing appetite in Westminster and more widely. In fact, I suspect the appetite more widely was always greater for what you might call systemic reform. To look not just at the issue of the politics and the policies, but whether actually promises were being delivered and how effective the system was uh, in achieving that. That was why Govern Up began as a cross-party and non-party initiative uh, those few years ago. John Healy and I were the first co-chairs, then Margaret Hodge, who has become one of our commissioners, became co-chair with me. We made a set of proposals. Some of them were picked up by the government of the day and some weren't. But we were still plowing quite a lonely furrow. COVID changed all of that. And suddenly, there has been a far more profound interest in whether the system of government is working properly, whether the machinery is functioning as well as we need it to work, whether we really do have a Rolls-Royce system of public administration. And it was against that background that a few of us came together to form the Commission for Smart Government as an initiative of Govern Up a year ago. One of the things I want to stress is that this is an independent initiative. It was our initiative. It was a few of us in this room and outside who came together and decided that we wanted to do this. Paul Marshall, me, Daniel Korski, and we then started talking to others who became our fellow commissioners realizing that there was 
a considerable enthusiasm from different walks of life to look at this issue. Nobody in government asked us to do this job, and we are independent, cross-party and non-party. And the fact that we are, I think, is demonstrated uh, by the way in which we have framed this report, which is manifestly independent in what we have said that we believe government needs to do. That said, we've always been grateful for the fact that those at the senior levels in government, and in particular, uh, Michael Gove as Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster with responsibility for these issues, was publicly encouraging of the work that we set out to do, as he's been encouraging of the work that others have set out to do uh, in this area too, including Policy Exchange, who set up their own uh, commission at round about the uh, same time. So we brought together people who had experience in different walks of life, but relevant experience to bear. They were senior business people. They were people who had worked in government, either as very senior officials, two former permanent secretaries, or as advisors right at the heart of government. They were people who'd been ministers. Significantly, they included the previous lead non-executive director of uh, the government and the current lead non-executive director and indeed uh, non-executive directors of the cabinet office. So the experience which we drew together was uh, profound. What we shared was a desire to see the system of government uh, improve. And we shared a set of beliefs uh, about that. Uh, first of all, that what we were looking at were systemic problems, problems that ran across our whole system of public administration, and that these weren't problems that could simply be laid at the door of the civil service. The old debate uh, that has sometimes characterized uh, these issues of Whitehall Wars is one which I think COVID has well and truly left behind us. There is, I believe, a growing consensus, uh, both in the political world and in Whitehall, that there are systemic issues that are the responsibility of politicians and the public service to address together, and that we have a common endeavour. In the same way, we didn't find ourselves constrained by old debates about public versus private. These two were behind us. I think of the example of the Nightingale hospitals built uh, at such speed at the beginning of the COVID epidemic, widely praised for how quickly uh, they arrived. It, they, were, they were achieved as a result of what I'd call fusion government by, by the combined efforts of the public sector, the private sector, and indeed, uh, the military. Uh, and it's also, I think, highly significant that some of the uh, processes which would otherwise have meant that uh, designing those hospitals, building them, uh, producing them at such speed uh, would have taken a very long time, were uh, put aside because of the necessity of delivering them so quickly. And there was, uh, we thought, some learning there. We were also united in the belief that a principle that we should be seeking to embrace. And again, I think this was some of the learning of the COVID experience was that we need a system of government public administration that is open to talent, uh, where we can attract the brightest and the best to take leadership positions in doing what this country needs, whether that is at the political level or the level of advisors or people being brought in as uh, uh, experts or whether it's people being brought in with business uh, expertise, or whether it's recruiting the very best talent to be permanent me members of the civil service. Uh, we need a system that is open to the brightest and the best. And uh, alongside that principle, quite clearly, we also need a system of proper governance. Uh, we need a system uh, that is smart in the way it regulates the bringing in of talent so that it commands public confidence. Uh, and uh, in, ensures that the right people are being brought in. But the principle should be that that governance is opening doors to talent coming in, not closing them, that there shouldn't be a closed shop, that the kind of ring of steel which has sometimes existed around the system needs to be removed, and that we need a system uh, uh, where, where there is 
a, a more porous barrier in the ability of people uh, to come in and help. Perhaps that's uh, uh, best uh, exemplified by uh, Kate Bingham being brought in uh, to chair the vaccine task force. What's significant, and we refer to this specifically in our report about that, is not just the huge success of that ta task force, the way in which it delivered for the British people, uh, but the fact that it was so very strongly criticized at the time by uh, uh, people who uh, frankly um, should not have done so. Uh, and in fact, of course, it proved to be uh, a, a triumph. And I think we have some learning uh, from that. So yes, governance, but smart uh, governance too. What we did as a group of commissioners was set about uh, studying other countries, other systems, other governments, how things are done in a very open manner. We held a huge number of evidence sessions, some public and some private. We consulted extensively uh, with uh, people who've done things differently in other places. Uh, and we looked very closely at how complex, large corporates manage their strategy, their financial planning and their talent and their uh, delivery. We reached the conclusion as we did this work over the course of the last year, that it is impossible to be too radical. The more we talk collectively, the more we were drawn to the conclusion that real change is now an imperative. Indeed, we felt so strongly about this, that incremental change, gradual change, partial change would simply not do what is necessary uh, for us to be able to meet the challenges that confront the country, that we concluded that the government needed to embrace reform or fail. That is a stark conclusion to reach, but is one which our commission uh, believes honestly and passionately, that actually the moment for real reform has come and that COVID uh, is uh, has produced a moment, a moment where this now needs to be addressed. We think that the government's declaration, which Michael Gove launched here just a few weeks ago, is a really good start. It's significant in so many respects. Firstly, because it's a declaration that is joint between uh, political leaders, uh, between the government uh, and uh, the senior uh, leadership of the civil service. It does, as I say, put behind us this old argument about Whitehall Wars. Secondly, because its ambition was laudable. And uh, we have studied the declaration and identified so many areas uh, in our final report where uh, we think it is on the right track. What we're arguing for uh, is an acceleration uh, that actually it needs to go further if government is to meet its ambitions. And that's just the final thing I want to say by way of introduction. Uh, the, this government has very big ambitions uh, in relation to uh, achieving a net zero in a short space of time in a relation to leveling up. It also has very big challenges, uh, not least uh, as a result of the COVID experience and the legacy of a historic debt and deficit that as a result are being carried. At the same time, any government would have been facing uh, great challenges because of the pace of technological change and the new wave of technological change that is now uh, confronting us. All of this, it seems to us, argues for a greater radicalism and ambition about reform uh, than has been seen before uh, in this country. And it is uh, on that basis that we advance our ideas as a prescription for real change offered to the political leadership of this country, whoever happens to be in power, because we are a non-party and cross-party uh, commission that will help them to achieve their aims and thereby deliver for the British people. And that should, of course, be our lodestar. 
was the same mission that was set by Michael Gove in his Ditchley Park speech a year ago, that in the end, our ambition should be to make lives better for the British people. And that is why we think the system needs changing, because bold policy ambitions on their own are, ins are insufficient. What we need is a system that will enable us to deliver on those ambitions. And that was the premise of this commission. So we've identified the four headings uh, that our policy proposals uh, fall under. The four elements of reform, that government needs to be more strategic, that it needs to be more capable, that it needs to be innovative and embrace the digital revolution, and that it needs to be accountable in order to maintain public confidence, but in order also to drive that greater performance. Very briefly, I'm just going to cover the first of those elements on why I think government needs to be more strategic before handing over to uh, Sophie. There's been quite a bit of attention to this part of our proposals over the last couple of days, particularly in relation to our idea to create a department of the prime minister and cabinet, or in shorthand, a department of the prime minister. Some have said, why do you need to do this? Is this just accruing power to one individual? Uh, is this not just moving the deck chairs? Sir Suma Chakrabarti, a former permanent secretary who is one of our commissioners and is joining uh, this meeting online, has set out today very persuasively why this is a significant proposal, why it matters. Because actually in our system of government, we don't have the strategic coherence that we need. We do have a dislocation uh, in terms of our strategy between the Treasury, the Cabinet Office and number 10, which is relatively underpowered in terms of the number of people uh, that work there. The more we looked at the system, the more we compared it to other systems, the more we felt uh, that change uh, was needed. That strategy has to be properly defined. There has to be a process and a mechanism for that, that there has to be a plan for government that has to also allocate resources. And we don't have that at the moment. That's why we think a new department for the prime minister and the cabinet is so important. And of course it is significant that we are suggesting that there would be a treasury board in the prime minister's department which would be led by the chief secretary and that would incorporate the current spending responsibilities of the treasury of course this does match what happens uh, in other countries some may see this crudely through the prism of the relations between any chancellor and any uh, prime minister we don't see it like that we see this about achieving a structure that will allow proper financial management that hasn't happened in this country before and needs to happen if we're going to drive uh, reform and get the outcomes uh, that we want. So that's a brief background to the commission and to the first element of our reform. And I'm now going to hand over to Sophie Miramadi, our project director, who will talk about two other elements of our reforms, capability and innovation. And then I'll uh, talk briefly at the end about accountability before handing over to Michael Gove to respond. Thank you. Thank you. So the first thing to say is that our commissioners are drawn from Whitehall, from local government, from across the public sector. And they felt really, really strongly that the divisions between the different realms in the public service are a real barrier in developing a coherent, collaborative, unified approach. And so what we think we need is a single public service. This is something that's easy to say much harder to deliver in practice. But we think you could start with bringing together the leadership formally under a public service board. And we think you could have much, much more systematic training, um, joint training across the public service, starting perhaps with a single public service, single bar stream that cuts across the whole public sector. The other thing that we wanted to emphasize is that we think there needs to be much greater emphasis on management skills the hard and the soft skills needed to run really complex organizations to conceive and to oversee radical transformation programs. So these are skills which are much more prevalent in the private sector and indeed in other bits of the public sector than they are in Whitehall. We think that government could be a lot more energetic in sourcing these skills from outside central government and we think that an in-house recruiter or headhunter would really help with that. 
The other big change that we've suggested is replacing the permanent secretary role with a chief executive, which reflects the fact that this top role is about setting and executing a strategy and ensuring the effectiveness of departments. We also think that all officials should be able to demonstrate a suite of core skills before progressing into the senior civil service. That this should be, um, and that there should be a further set of advanced skills for progressing to director general level and, and above. And we think a major element of this should be around digital acumen. We think that there is a major need for a sort of uh, uplift in digital skills, not just in specialist roles, but across the whole of government. So we think that all new senior civil servants should be able to demonstrate knowledge of how to lead digital transformation, data management, knowledge of new and emerging technologies, how to apply AI intelligently, ethically to transforming um, services and increasing efficiency. Now, this isn't just a problem for government. Corporates also are having to, to rapidly upskill in digital. But the thing is that the moment for the civil service, there's, there's nothing like the kind of management training programs which are on offer um, from the world leading business schools, from Harvard, from Stanford, from LBS. So we think that the government should set up a world leading MBA style executive leadership program to train public servants and ministers side by side and attract high flyers from across the world who want to study the art or, or maybe the science of government and building a first class faculty um, and a research program to support that. So talking about innovation. What do really innovative organizations look like? They tend to be highly collaborative, non-hierarchical, an intense focus on the problems that they're solving. They don't look very much like government. So what does this mean for government's desire to innovate? Well, the first thing is that public services need to be intrinsically digital. If you're gonna have genuine transformation, you need to embed digital. You can't just overlay it on an analog process. And the current departmental and structures and funding make this really, really hard to do. So what we suggested here is, is taking service areas out of departments and creating digital task forces that would have a remit to completely redesign um, cloud-based services, building from the ground up. And you could start, we suggested, with early years support or with business support. Um, in Singapore, they now have a, a single hub where businesses can come for anything from support with R&D credits or your tax um, or, uh, or um, anything like that. So uh, we also think that we need to put um, much greater emphasis on innovation at the local level, uh, bringing together talented teams of people who can carry out radical experiments in, in service design. Um, a former, um, uh, in fact, Connie McKenzie, who, uh, who gave evidence to, to our commission earlier in the summer, um, talked about these as being free ports for social policy. And we think that this is exactly what we should be doing. So we also want to talk about the link between strategy and goals and innovation. So in tech, they talk about 10x innovation, making things that are 10 times better than what is currently on offer. So they're deliberately using ambitious goals to provoke innovation, goals that can't be reached by simply retooling your current systems, goals that require a complete overhaul and a fundamental rethink. So, so what does 10x innovation look like in government? Now, we actually think we've seen quite a lot of that in the last year, the establishment of the furlough scheme, the vaccine program, for example. But the question is, how do you bottle that? How do you standardize the ability to rapidly and radically innovate without the extreme external pressure of a pandemic? So we talked to Joanna Rowland, the transformation director at HMRC, who oversaw the standing up of the furlough scheme and the grants for self-employed in a matter of weeks and asked her, you know, what underpinned that? And the first thing she said was that the department's previous investment in overhauling its digital systems made it, made it possible. It wouldn't have been possible without doing that. But she also said that the most important thing in the success of the program was the clarity of strategic intent from the chancellor down to the coders to get the money to the people who needed it as soon as possible. And that's something that Kate Bingham has also spoken about the very clear goal that she was given by the Prime Minister to save lives as soon as possible. So that brings us back again to the central importance of having a really clear strategic plan with clearly defined and ambitious goals 
in order to give a laser focus on the handful of things that really matter and give people a license to innovate. Steve Jobs says that innovation means saying no to a thousand things. I'll pass over to Nick to talk about accountability. Okay, I'm not going to say too much more uh, before asking Michael uh, to respond. Uh, I just want to pick up on uh, a couple of the things that we've left out. Firstly, I thought it was significant, uh, and you may have picked up on this, when Sophie uh, mentioned the scheme that we want to introduce uh, in uh, the public service for an MBA-style uh, course and uh, the Queen Elizabeth uh, Centre that is going to be able to uh, offer that. It's an incredibly exciting proposal. But I hope that you notice that we're suggesting that it should be available for ministers and political leaders as well. I thought it was a good exemplar of the approach we've taken, which is to recognize that actually this is an issue, as I said before, uh, for the whole system, and that means for the political side as well. And today, uh, alongside a detailed talent paper that we uh, published, we also published a discussion paper on ministers, uh, which did set out uh, some suggestions about how the role of ministers could be strengthened. It's hard because it's a completely unique job as a number of us who are on the commission know perfectly well or worked in roles with ministers and perfectly well uh, understood. But we do think that this is an area that needs further ex exploration because it is, the, it is the other side of the equation. One of the principles also that I mentioned was this idea of openness, uh, the ability of our system to bring good people in and that learning during COVID was very powerful. So again, one of the recommendations we've made that's attracted attention over the last couple of days is uh, the ability that we suggest for a prime minister to bring in people as ministers who are not parliamentarians. This was suggested to us by George Osborne in an evidence session uh, that we held with him at the beginning of our work as the commission. It's constitutionally entirely possible and you would be able to set up proper mechanisms of accountability to ensure that those individuals could answer to parliament. It's important to note that we suggest this as, a, as a, an exceptional measure. Uh, it's not a proposal uh, to replace uh, swathes of members of parliament who are currently uh, ministers and uh, it needs to be viewed in that light. But at the moment, we have a system of bringing in people to the House of Lords. Sometimes that works, sometimes it proves very difficult for those individuals, even where they are exceptionally talented uh, individuals, uh, to succeed. And we think that model needs looking at uh, again. And it is an example of the radical thinking that we are suggesting. But I think the proposal needs studying properly and it should not be misunderstood. The last thing I just want to say about ministers is that we are also proposing uh, that the Prime Minister uh, should no longer use number 10 as the working headquarters of the government. It should be the ceremonial headquarters and the Prime Minister's residence. But any of us who have been in number 10 know that it is actually not fit for purpose as a modern building for uh, a hub of government. And we think that there would be huge advantages in locating the Prime minister's office uh, away from number 10 at the head of a ministerial hub where all ministers would work together. Uh, this happens, for instance, in New Zealand in the so-called beehive. Uh, it does help to create that sense of uh, collegiate working. It helps to uh, break down the barriers between uh, government departments. And that is a, one of the very important principles that we want to try and drive towards, that actually the wicked problems happen uh, across government departments. They don't recognize government departments and they need to be tackled on a basis between government departments and indeed between government and local government and business and other uh, parts of our system, including uh, NGOs in joint collaborative teams. We've got lots of ideas for that, but one of the ways that we could achieve this greater collaborative working would be if there was a ministerial center and that could be located in uh, the Queen Elizabeth Conference Centre, uh, or it could be located in somewhere like Lancaster House, or it could be located on the redeveloped parliamentary estate that would be close to 10 Downing Street anyway. So we think, again, this is not 
a token suggestion. It's not just a symbolic change. It would be really meaningful in terms of how well government worked uh, in the future. Finally, just on accountability, we set out a series of proposals to improve transparency and accountability, including an Ofsted for government departments to really drive their effectiveness and focus on delivery. Uh, and uh, we've proposed that commission letters, which exist in Canada, uh, and which are used privately to uh, tell ministers what the expectations from the Prime Minister for them are, should become public as a means of uh, being very clear about the strategic mission of uh, that individual, but also ensuring uh, accountability. And uh, we've published some very interesting work on this uh, uh, based on the uh, an understanding of what's happening in, in Canada. So there are lots of uh, proposals there uh, I I about accountability uh, that I would encourage people to have a look at. We say this finally before handing over to Michael. I just want to thank my fellow commissioners for all of their work over the course of the last year. It has been invigorating. I think it's been really encouraging to find how much agreement there was between us, despite the fact that many of us came from quite different uh, parts of the system and different walks of life. I mentioned business leaders, tech leaders, adv advisors, local government uh, 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 officials. Uh, we became ever more united by the conviction that the system needs to change. And many of us uh, are very determined to actually keep this work going uh, so that we can continue to uh, produce the ideas and exert the pressure for change in our system. But I would very much like to thank my fellow commissioners for the work uh, that they have put in uh, over the course of the last year. And I'd just lastly like to thank uh, our uh, small commission staff, particularly Sophie Miramadi, our project director, who's just presented to you, Martin Wheatley, our research director, who've done brilliant work, and another a number of other um, uh, 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 staff who've uh, helped us with uh, our research. Without you, none of this would have been possible. I think it's appropriate to thank uh, one commissioner in particular, uh, Daniel Korski, because we are in public hall uh, launching this event. And without uh, Daniel's uh, encouragement and inspiration at the beginning of this work, the Commission for Smart Government would never have happened. And his input, particularly in the digital side, which has been such an important part of our work and the innovation has been absolutely vital. Thank you all. And I'm now delighted to hand over to Michael Goh. Well, I want to begin by saying thank you. Thank you to Nick, thank you to Sophie, but thank you to all of the commissioners and thank you <clears throat> to the three who were present at the creation, to Nick, to Dan, um, and to Sir Paul Marshall um, for making sure that this work could come to fruition. It's been remarkable how much has been achieved in a relatively short period of time. And uh, Nick, Dan, Paul, all of you have been ahead of your time. Um, government reform used to be, as Nick has acknowledged, a niche interest. Uh, a bit like uh, curiosity about medieval wood carvings um, or entomology. It was the sort of thing which if you broached on social occasions, you would find people distancing themselves from you. But much in the same way as two years ago, if you'd introduced yourself at a social occasion as an epidemiologist and people would have rapidly changed the subject. Now, two years on, you will find that you are the focus of attention in that conversation. In the same way, over the course of the last few years, those who've been working in the area of government reform and those who've been thinking and acting as deeply as Nick and his team have done, are now at the centre of political debate. And that's a recognition that the need for government reform is more urgent than ever. As Nick pointed out, both the experience of the COVID pandemic, but also some of the political changes that have happened as a result of uh, our departure from the European Union, but also more critically, uh, technological and social changes that have been occurring in our own country and others have meant that the, uh, the need to look at the uh, hidden wiring of government has become more pressing than ever. And whatever shape we want our common home of the United Kingdom to be, we need to recognise uh, that that wiring is uh, no longer anywhere near adequate for our needs. In fact, uh, unless it's overhauled comprehensively, uh, then um, unfortunately we won't be able to achieve the goals, however noble, uh, that we all share. Um, and as Nick pointed out, um, there is now a consensus, not a perfect, but a growing consensus 
about the sort of work that's required. Uh, that consensus extends across people from politics, um, from public service, from uh, local government, from business, uh, Remainers, Leavers, Tories, Labour, none of the above. Uh, there is an emerging consensus about the importance of making sure that we deploy data better, that we're digitally literate, um, uh, and that we uh, think in a new way about how we deploy the talent of people across the United Kingdom who believe in public service. Um, and I think that uh, uh, the approach that Nick and the team have taken, that the commissioners have taken uh, to opening up government is absolutely right. We've tended to have a medieval guild structure when it comes to the civil service and in particular to ministerial life. Um, and while uh, there is much in uh, uh, the old fashioned guild structure that has a certain romantic appeal, we need to move beyond it. So I think absolutely the principle that people can serve by exception as ministers uh, 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 and who are drawn for a period of time from different disciplines is absolutely right. We did it during the Second World War. Uh, we saw it with the example of Lord Beaverbrook oft cited. Um, we saw it even though he wasn't a minister with the example of Prof Lindemann, whom I cited just a few weeks ago. Um, and as the Commission's report points out, quoting Peter Hennessy, much of the innovation that happened during the Second World War was set aside immediately thereafter, even as a great programme of social reform was being undertaken. And if we look particularly at how we've dealt with some of the challenges of COVID over the course of the last couple of years, it's striking. And I know it's always invidious to name names, but I have to. Kate Bingham, of course, performed heroically, coming from outside and being criticised, um, or rather the government was criticised for deploying her. But it's also the case that the chief executive of the NHS, who made sure that the NHS so far has weathered the storm and who was responsible overall for the vaccination programme, Sir Simon Stevens, let's not forget, he was previously a political appointee. He then worked for the private sector in healthcare in America, before, out of a spirit of public service, coming back to the institution that he joined immediately after he left university, the NHS, to which he was committed. I don't think anyone looking at Sir Simon's record can say that he's been anything other than a highly successful leader of that institution. Also, Emily Williams, who was responsible for the uh, direct program of uh, vaccination uh, deployment. Uh, uh, Emily Lawson um, has been a, um, uh, a civil servant, but she's also been a management consultant. She has worked outside and inside uh, government. Emily uh, Lawson is now going to head up the new delivery unit and number 10, and she has precisely the mix of skills and the right background in order to drive change. Um, there are others whom I could mention, but these are three, Kate, Emily, and Simon, who will provide proof that porosity, breaking up that guild structure, is entirely the way to go. Um, the other thing that I, I should stress is that the approach towards reform that um, uh, Nick and fellow commissioners enjoin on us is the one that we embrace, the idea that we should be collaborative. Uh, it has sometimes been the case in the past uh, that reform of government has been seen as an arm wrestling match between uh, ministers and civil servants, um, and it's never going to succeed if it's seen in that way. So without um, uh, wanting to um, criticize anyone, uh, arguments about wars on Whitehall or uh, the hardness or softness of rain, all of that sort of language, I'm not sure that phrase was actually ever used by the person to whom it was attributed, but put that to one side, all that sort of language gets in the way of the work that we all need to do as one team. And that is why I think that the approach that's taken towards thinking of public service overall as a, uh, a unified uh, mission and thinking about creating a fast stream overall is one worth exploring. Um, and some, for example, of the fossilized divisions that exist within our own civil service, between the diplomatic service and the home civil service and so on, uh, do I think need to be re-examined um, and looked at again. Now, quite a lot of the work of government reform, um, and this is where I take my hat off to all of the commissioners, is, when you first look at it, rather dull. Let me give you one small example. I don't know how many of you uh, enjoy looking at organograms. It's not my favorite weekend activity. But way back when, in 2010, Francis Maud, when he was doing the job that I'm doing now, said quite rightly that uh, the public, taxpayers, ministers, should have a right to know who's deployed, in which government department, doing what. So it might be a good idea in the uh, Ministry of Fish and Chips to see who the Director General is for fish, who the Director General is for chips, who works underneath them, and what they do, how many people are deployed in the world of malt vinegar. How many people are deployed in making sure that we've got the right degree of salt? Quite a good idea. Most organizations would do that. Um, when I asked uh, uh, if the organograms uh, that Francis had suggested should be made public, 
and which were agreed across government that they should be made public were available. I was told, actually, apart from one for the cabinet office itself, not a single government department had an up-to-date organogram showing who was responsible, where they were deployed, and what the uh, 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 number of staff working in each area was. Um, it is now the case that uh, uh, the cabinet secretary and the chief executive of the civil service, Alex Chisholm, who's permanent secretary at the cabinet office, have explained to all permanent secretaries and all secretaries of state that we need by the 22nd of July to have up-to-date and accurate organograms, which let us know exactly who is doing what in each department. And I'll look forward to making sure that those are published and shared so that all of us can see exactly how effectively we are using the resources which were entrusted to us in order to deliver for the public. And that takes me to Nick's central point. Ultimately, the need for a more strategic approach, the need for greater accountability, um, the need for greater agility is all about serving the public better. And that is the, the key test. So um, when we ask for data to be shared, it's not because we're indulging in an abstract academic exercise in uh, seeking to prove a particular point, whether ideologically or schematically. What we're doing is saying uh, the money that we spend, the uh, incursions on freedom that we from time to time necessarily have to impose, all of these are only justified if you, the public, can see what we are doing in your name. And that's why it's so important um, that we uh, uh, capture and uh, catalyze the uh, spirit of reform uh, that I hope was there in the government declaration and certainly animates every page of the Commission's report. And one of the things that we've also asked today is that in the Cabinet Office we look at every single one of the recommendations that the Commission has made and match them against those steps that we are taking. Is it the case that everything that we've already set in train will achieve these goals, albeit in a slightly different way with a slightly different uh, uh, you know, typology or name or, or description? Um, is it the case that uh, while uh, the Commission makes a compelling uh, case for a particular course of action under one heading, we're achieving the same under another? Uh, is it the case that there is anything in the Commission's recommendations which we think, for whatever reason, is unwise or wrong or ill-timed? And if so, why? And we should be clear about why it is that we disagree. And in those areas where the Commission, like the best sort of fitness or football coach, is urging us to look inside, to find that extra level of energy, stamina and commitment in order to achieve, then how can we do so? How can we match the level of ambition that's been set for us from the outside? So I just wanted again to say thank you to Nick and thank you to all of the commissioners. Uh, you have set us um, an exacting program to match. As I say, we will be looking at it over the course of the next two days and weeks. That's why today I can't give uh, journalistic colleagues who may want me to endorse the idea of a Prime Minister's Department a definitive answer on that question, because the question that we are asking ourselves is to what extent is the ambition that's set out, the admirable uh, desire that's set out in uh, the Commission uh, work being already uh, driven forward by our own programme of reform. And if it's not, then we'll let you know. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Michael. We're now going to move the lectern so that we can just uh, all three of us sit up here and uh, take some questions. Uh, just while uh, the lectern's being moved, um, I can just um, tell you, Michael, that uh, uh, we're in the happy position that uh, in the in the Commission's uh, report we we set out the declarations uh, key recommendations and uh, then we identify where our recommendations go further. Uh, so so we've started that process of work for you, but we're we're absolutely delighted to hear that you will be looking at each of the recommendations specifically, and that's incredibly encouraging. And thank you very very much indeed for coming and uh, responding. Um, right, um, should we start with? Uh, um, uh, uh, any anybody in the room who would like to uh, ask a question? Uh, if you do, uh, please, can you just go and talk uh, to the microphones? Uh, obviously, we can hear you in the room, but uh, it, it, those who are joining us virtually won't be able to hear you unless you use one of the microphones uh, here. Uh, so if there's anybody in the room who'd like to ask something now, please do uh, stick your hand up and uh, go to the microphone. Otherwise, um, I'm going to go and find somebody uh, on, online. Deborah Cavanagh. And Deborah is, is um, Chief Executive of Birmingham City Council and one of our commissioners. Thank you, Deborah. Thank, thank you. Um, so it's been a brilliant experience and being part of this, but what time scale are you giving 
uh, the Commission for delivery on the recommendations? Uh, a challenging question from one of our own commissioners. Uh, <laughs> we, we, haven't, um, we haven't set a, a, a timetable for any of the recommendations. We have said that the, the, um, the task is urgent. Uh, that, I think, is the, the, the language that we used. Uh, we think all of our recommendations are doable. Uh, they are radical, but they are all doable. Uh, and I don't think any of them are things that uh, need to be done over a period of years. I think they are all things that could be done, actually, if government wanted to, right away. Uh, and uh, it may be that there are one or two recommendations uh, that are exceptional in, in, in that respect. Uh, so um, I think that the scale of the ambition that confronts the government and the, um, the scale of the challenge to the marriage of those two things make this urgent. Uh, and that's the sense that we want to convey in the recommendations. And Deborah, you're nodding, and so I think you probably agree. <laughs> uh, thank you. Daniel. Daniel Korski, who I mentioned, who's another one of our commissioners. Thank you very much. And, and big kudos to you, Nick, for leading the commission um, to, to this conclusion. Um, first of all, Michael, thank you for welcoming the commission and its report. And, and it's great to, to, to hear your spirit of uh, collaboration. Um, I guess I want to ask just one question on, on the digital transformation that everybody talks about and indeed successive governments have been so focused on. Now you have laid out in the government uh, agenda how important it is, you talked about it when you came here earlier, you've hired great people to get it done. Um, but a lot of people worry about whether this is actually going to happen. How can we make sure that the sort of digital transformation we've seen in every other sector in every part of society really comes to public services in the way I think citizens expect? What are we going to do to really make sure it happens? What are the sort of incentives we're going to provide for the system to deliver in the way I think modern citizens with their smartphones in their pockets really want? Well, um, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, um, you worry, I worry um, about the extent to which we're going to deliver it because there are, um, as we know, a number of barriers. Within um, organizations, people believe that control of data gives them power. Um, and so therefore, the, that, that's one reason why people don't, for example, share the data uh, that they should. It's also the case that um, there are people who are spooked by uh, what they think is within data protection legislation, which um, uh, often isn't there and therefore they're not incentivized or encouraged to uh, share appropriately. Um, the third thing is that uh, uh, related to some of those concerns about legitimate to my mind and important concerns about privacy, it is also the case that when you talk about um, uh, one login, uh, that people think that this means that the government, rather than putting itself at the service of the citizen, is trying to turn the citizen into um, a cog or a byte in a broader machine, um, which um, uh, a government can deploy for its convenience, not for the citizen's convenience. I think the best way of um, winning the argument um, is by demonstrating specific examples where transformative change occurs as a result, either of providing uh, a more effective platform uh, in the delivery of government service or by sharing data in a more appropriate way. So some of the work that I know is going on here, um, some of the people who are thinking in GovTech about how we can ensure that uh, uh, you can see uh, the benefits is right. And I think uh, provided we take a purpose-driven approach, then we can win the argument. Um, just last week, I had the opportunity to visit um, another great organization, Palantir, um, um, one of the things that they have been doing is looking, for example, in the case of Chelsea and Westminster Hospital, how we can get the journey from someone, first of all, presenting with um, symptoms to eventually being treated, um, uh, concertinaed. Um, um, uh, anyone who takes the, 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 the time to, and doesn't take that long, to see what they can do, can't but fail to be uh, convinced uh, that this is a hugely beneficial approach. And some of those who were initially suspicious, consultants who feared that they were going to be uh, deprofessionalized, in fact, found that this gave them far more control over their time, what was happening in, uh, in operating theaters, and freed them to do the work that they wanted to do. So seeing is believing. Thank you, Michael. Uh, I, we have a number of our commissioners who are joining us uh, virtually, and I wonder whether we might, be, might have the opportunity to go to them now. So I can see, uh, Yes, I can see you all here. Hi, um, Jane Angardia, Suma Chakrabarti, Margaret Hodge. Hello, Margaret. Margaret, would you like to go, go first and, and ask a question or say anything? Perhaps not, because I think you're frozen. OK, um, Suma, Suma, can I cue you in Hi. from, from um, wherever you are? 
Well, great, greetings to everyone from Tashkent in Uzbekistan, where I'm sort of dealing with governance of a different sort, I think. Um, but uh, it's really good to be here, and it's been a fantastic commission, a great launch today. I just wanted to make one point, really, I think partly for media, for all of us, is that the report isn't just about the civil service. It's about government in the round, and it covers issues and proposals for ministers as much as the public service and the civil service. And, uh, you know, in one of our discussion papers, we were very clear that ministers begin their roles unprepared and have little access to training or professional development. They lack clear direction uh, or mandate, and that limits their impact, which we want to improve. Um, and they don't get enough support, frankly, in their role. So a lot of our proposals around that. I mean, you both mentioned the whole idea of opening up um, appointments. I think that's very important to non-parliamentarians. But also beyond that, I mean, just giving ministers, budding ministers, budding politicians, a sort of training that also civil servants and public servants need to get. And that's why the, the QE2 uh, idea, the uh, training idea, is, I think, fantastic as well. Um, I would also say just making them more publicly accountable by publishing those mandate letters, the, as Canada has done, and I think it's really important because that will make ministers much more accountable as well, publicly. And of course, Daniel would love this, uh, but I'm with him on this, which is the whole idea of digitizing the ministerial experience, if you like, um, by moving away from red boxes, even WhatsApp by government, frankly, towards uh, modern tools, which would give ministers real data in real time. Uh, on performance. I think that's very, very important too. So there's a whole agenda there about trying to make political leadership work better. And I think that's uh, it's a supportive uh, agenda, not a critical agenda, but it would make ministers perform better, thereby making public service, I think, work better as well. I think it's worth highlighting that so that people don't get the idea this is just about the civil service and moving debt chairs and things, which it isn't. Well, thank you, Subra. And I, I, I think all of us on the Commission uh, feel very strongly uh, about that and ag agree with you. And uh, I hope that the thrust of that has come across in our proposals when we talk about one public service and uh, uh, the fact that we've published a paper, as I mentioned, on ministers uh, uh, today alongside the proposals is also uh, evidence uh, of that. Michael, did you want to respond at all to anything sooner? Uh, I, think I, I think that is absolutely right. I benefited um, from an initiative that Francis Maud um, uh, introduced when we were in opposition, Francis insisted that ministers who might be forming part of the government after the 2010 general election work on the implementation of their ideas with outside expertise. And so um, I had the benefit of a variety of people, including uh, Sir Michael Barber and people from business and others from education and local government, uh, uh, testing the deliverability, not the, you know, political appropriateness, but the deliverability of the plans that we had uh, uh, beforehand. Now, th th that was a unique circumstance with, a, with a, uh, an opposition party with a reasonable expectation of forming government and some time to do that. Um, but I think overall that is uh, missing. I think that uh, organizations like the Blavatnik School and the Institute for Government uh, seek to help in this area. But I think some of the recommendations that have been put forward about a further degree of professionalization and training mm -hmm. is right. I also remember visiting Canada um, in, and talking to some of the people who helped the Harper government come in. And again, the, the, the principle of the mandate letter being outlined then, this is 2006, yeah. seven. Um, and it seems to me that um, uh, that should be absolutely transparent. You know, there should be three elements to a mandate letter, I think, but it's up for uh, a discussion. One, general expectations of what ministers should do uh, uh, collaboratively to achieve the government's goals. Secondly, departmental specific um, initiatives to which they should be held account. And then thirdly, a broad outline of the approach that the government's going to take towards standards, ethics, and so on. Um, uh, and so I think that is, is spot on. Um, the final thing that I would say is just, an, in, in, and this is just thinking aloud, is that uh, obviously there are different routes into government. One thing though that I would say is that um, <clears throat> people sometimes deprecate um, uh, so-called professional politicians, you know, people who've been special advisors and who then go into, into government. Um, I think it would be tragic if there were only one route into government, um, but I also think that, in a way, uh, being a special advisor is in some respects akin to being an apprentice, um, in that you, you learn from uh, others what some of the things in government should do, and, and so therefore I think that the, uh, uh, you know, the view that some take that somehow that route is uh, a slightly less respectable one 
um, I, I think is wrong, but it is only one of a number of ways in which people can acquire the something of the skills and understanding and appreciation needed. I should say that perhaps an even better way would be running a public sector organisation. So I think that if there are more people who can come into government who have led or played a senior role in public sector organisations, people who have been leaders of major local authorities and so on, um, and at the risk of um, uh, what's the word, uh, causing trouble. You know, if we look at someone like Steve Reed, who we might disagree with on a huge number of things, uh, the fact that he was a leader of a local authority um, does mean that uh, he brings something to the Labour Front branch that perhaps some of his colleagues do. Yeah, um, David Blunkett might be uh, a point. very powerful example of that, but I'm sure we could think of uh, many others. Um, we're running out of time, um, uh, but I didn't know whether any of our other commissioners, either present or virtually, joining us would like to say uh, anything or whether there are any other questions. I have one question I can see in the uh, chat that I'd like just to uh, read out because I think it's a really good one. Mark, Mark Rowley. Mark is another one of our commissioners, uh, former assistant commissioner in the Met, as I'm sure you all know. Thank you. Um, thank you for sort of interesting comments today. One of the things that struck me about our combined view is the challenge from a people perspective in terms of the reforms to come. And everyone had the same view that the civil service is full of fantastic, talented, committed people. Um, but the skill set, both in terms of what's recruited and the training and development within the organisation, are both a very long way off where they ought to be. To, to end up with people with the right mix of policy and delivery skills and the right specialist delivery skills across technology, project management, etc. Given that's about the whole of civil service, it's not just about the senior and the sort of school of government type thing. That to me seems one of the most challenging, largest dependencies on getting this. Meeting. I just wonder if you had any, any thoughts on the speed that you might be prepared to try and look at the way the <coughs> civil service is shaped and recruited. I think that's absolutely correct. And I think um, there are some brilliant ideas um, in um, uh, the report. I mean, the, the point about establishing a crown headhunter in order to recruit talented people from outside, I think, is a fair one. We've got um, um, uh, uh, in government at the moment, something we're setting up wrong, we're prosaically called a secondment unit. Um, uh, it sounds drab, but it, 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 it's almost uh, the recommendation there. So it's, it's, it's one area where we met. But we must do much more. Um, uh, if I can use an analogy which may not be perfect, but I, th I hope serves a purpose. Um, the Conservative Party used to select its candidates by a particular process and left it to every constituency association just to decide. Um, and there was an element of market failure. Each constituency association would tend, there were some majestic exceptions to this, but would tend to select as their <coughs> candidate the sort of person who was like already existing successful MPs and ministers. And that meant that the constituency, each individual constituency association, would essentially choose someone who was a combination of uh, Anthony Eden, Winston Churchill, uh, and so on. <laughs> Nothing wrong with it. Um, but action required to be taken in order to say, well, if every association does the same thing, then uh, it will be ill served. Um, in the same way, there is perhaps a platonic ideal of what a permanent secretary should be. Um, and that platonic ideal is a, you know, Robin Butler or, or, or whatever. He's brilliant, was brilliant, is brilliant. But if we think that every permanent secretary, a leader in the civil service should be uh, like Sir Robin, uh, Lord Butler, I should say now, um, then we make a mistake. And therefore we have to think harder about how we challenge perceptions um, and uh, expand the pool of skills and the pool of talent. And, and one of the things that I would say is, it would seem to me eminently uh, uh, worth looking at, and we have in the past, but we should do so again, uh, getting people who have delivery experience in other areas, both of the public, charitable and private sectors, to come into senior roles um, in government. And in particular, while you will always need brilliant policy generalists, it should be the case that some in the very top of the civil service should be celebrated for their specific delivery purpose. So if one were, for example, to have someone who had been a former uh, 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 number two or three in the Met Police who'd been responsible for coordinating some of the most sensitive delivery challenges in the field of national security, who might potentially be a future permanent secretary, that would be a good thing. Well, 
Thanks. Well, I, uh, I, I strongly endorse Michael's uh, remarks, if only because I was an A-list prototype myself and certainly wouldn't have been a member of parliament, but for, uh, but for some of those uh, sort of steps um, uh, that were taken. Um, I've got a question here from Alex Thomas um, uh, at the Institute for Government. I just want to say that the Institute for Government has uh, uh, been very helpful in the course of the last year in the the work that uh, we've done. Uh, we've consulted them, drawn on their work uh, extensively, uh, and have been very grateful for that. Uh, and uh, I note that uh, Alex Thomas has been uh, at the forefront of arguing that number 10 needs to be powered up in the way that we have uh, suggested. But Alex has, uh, has uh, just sent a slightly more challenging question here. Um, which says, congratulations on the report with many stimulating ideas. Um, and that I touched on this, but can we, actually it says you, but I'm gonna say we, say a bit more about how you reconcile the management of government with the politics of government. Mm. For example, the Treasury Board is an interesting innovation that may well improve financial management, but it won't deal with structural tensions between number 10 and mm. HMT. Uh, and Ofsted for departments would be useful, but will Secretaries of State ever agree to set it up to publish its verdicts? And uh, it was interesting that uh, Jonathan Powell wrote to the Times on uh, Friday, Saturday, to endorse uh, our proposals both for the creation of a Prime Minister's Department and for the proposal to bring in ministers uh, as non-parliamentarians, both of which he said yeah. Tony Blair would like to have done as Prime Minister. Uh, but in the former case, in relation to creating the Prime Minister's Department with input from the Treasury was thwarted by Gordon Brown. And Jonathan Powell actually said that in his letter uh, to the Times. So this is clearly an opposite question. Mm. Um, I just, I'll have a go at answering and then, and then Michael may, may want to, but um, one of the things Suma said earlier in the video that he recorded, which is available on our website, and I would encourage everyone to listen to, is how useful he thought the kind of Ofsted idea for departments was, and that is uh, a former permanent secretary speaking. Uh, uh, and so on. So I think that uh, we can uh, get uh, permanent secretaries and the civil service to buy in uh, to uh, these ideas. Transparency will be demanding, yes, but the whole potency of the Canada uh, mandate letters, as we just heard from Michael, was that they were transparent and they are now seen as an important means not just of knowing what ministers have been asked to do in Canada, but of accountability. And that was what uh, was emphasized to us when we consulted uh, with Canadian officials uh, about it. So I think the answer to that part of the question is, is yes. I think that the system is persuadable. On the issue of uh, creating a prime minister's department and a treasury board into which part of the uh, role of the treasury would be uh, brought in, um, I would point out that there are other systems around the world that do this, uh, as I mentioned. I mean, Australia is one uh, example where actually the role, the spending role and the, the chancellor's macroeconomic role are in two separate individuals and not all vested within um, one treasury uh, 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 and so on. So um, I would just encourage the government to look at the merits of this proposal for what it aims to achieve and to approach it as one government uh, uh, and so on, and uh, not on the basis of somebody uh, temporarily having an interest in protecting the department, which is what has happened when these proposals have been made uh, in the past. Um, uh, I know exactly what you mean. Um, um, the first thing I would say is um, uh, I know exactly why the, the case has been made for the particular reform. Um, we have to look at it because it's, it's big potatoes, um, um, and it may be that there are uh, smarter, defter, um, or uh, more effective ways of achieving that goal, but it, but the onus is on us to explain why, and um, and 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 I and I hope we can. Uh, the second thing is, um, you are right. Uh, politics is politics, and personalities are personalities. Um, so, um, it had been again more coalition anecdotage. It had been the case before the 2010 election that um, the Conservatives, had they been in office without there being a coalition, would have taken, as we eventually did, universities out of the business department and into the Department for Education, where they had once been. But when the coalition was formed, um, uh, Vince Cable, great man, could not contemplate having a department smaller than the one that Peter Mandelson had. <laughs> so therefore, universities had to be in it. 
uh, uh, a figure in the Conservative government uh, when it was put to them, I shan't identify who it is, uh, that uh, it would be logistically coherent to challenge uh, Vince's view on that, said, um, you may well be right. Uh, but it is the case that it will now be a Liberal Democrat cabinet minister who will be explaining how important it is to implement Michael Barber's pr proposals on tuition fees. So sometimes, out of the crooked timber of political humanity, no straight thing is ever made. So, of course, one has to be realistic about these things. Um, but the case that uh, the Commission makes overall, I think, is powerful. Um, and we will have to be judged by how effectively we either uh, assent to or explain why we're diverging from your recommendations. <laughs> okay, Michael. Well, thank you very much indeed. I think that's a very good uh, point at which to wrap up. Thank you very much indeed for our commissioners uh, for joining us, uh, those who are here and those who joined us online. Thank you, everybody else who has joined us online. I hope that you enjoyed this event. We will be uh, making the event available, uh, recording of it uh, on our website uh, in due course. I would encourage all of you, and in particular uh, the media, uh, to read the report uh, where there are a lot of recommendations that have not yet uh, received the attention they deserve, particularly, I would suggest, in relation to the talent paper, where there are a lot of pretty crunchy recommendations uh, about uh, how to make the civil service more capable uh, that I think deserve uh, uh, more attention. That paper was just published today, and, uh, and I hope that may be covered over the course of the next uh, few days. But we are uh, delighted that you were all able to uh, join us. Thank you once again uh, to everyone who's made this commission possible, and good night. <laughs>